Welcome to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk. I'm here once again with our wonderful Mayor Susan Brooks for oh, our monthly you. update. And she's here always to share the latest and greatest things happening in the city. Always wonderful to have you here. Great, Liz. Thank you. It's great to be here and thank you for our RPV TV and everything you do. Uh, well, we, to we're, make it so great. We're, we're so glad to be here. And just to bring our community up to speed, a lot of things happening um, with City Council, but we're going to first start off with one of the most recent events was congratulations um, for the city's 40th gala celebration held at Terranea Resort. It was an amazing event. I was fortunate enough to be there with the RPV TV crew and the community just all came together to celebrate 40 years of cityhood and I know you had a lot to do with putting that party together and you must have been thrilled because it was a beautiful event. It, thank you. It was, it was a beautiful event and I have to say kudos to the volunteers who helped and to the staff. Um, you know that the, the um, the attention to detail was amazing. I mean, when people walked into that room and they were able to see those centerpieces that Carolyn Petru designed and then the assembly line that was made to put it together, um, it was just a beautiful opportunity for the Land Conservancy to show, dem to show their demonstrations and for um, people from all over the Palos Verdes Peninsula to be here. Uh, we had people from Palos Verdes Estates, not just city officials, um, Rolling Hills, Rolling Hills Estates, and Rancho Palos Verdes. And after all, um, if it weren't for all the other peninsula cities, Rancho Palos Verdes would not be here. And if it weren't for the League of Women Voters and those wonderful women, um, Dina Friedson and Betty Field Strauss and Barbara Gleghorn right. and um, Dorothy LeConte and Helene Drown and I could go on and on, but there were a lot of women who were very instrumental in getting the city started. But Fred Hess, the mayor of Rolling Hills, you know, he put so much into it to see to it that all these properties were assessed to help towards incorporation. But when you think about it, 43 battles, Liz, um, it's no wonder why we're still celebrating at 40 years. Um, some cities might not think that's such a great deal. But we went through, well, I didn't, but the original people went through so much just to get the city incorporated that it really is a celebration. And it's really worth celebrating when we look around today and see what we see. Absolutely. And of course, your theme was 40 and fabulous. Um, and it was a fabulous night. And as you talk about this whole fight for cityhood 40 you know, years ago, and that was over a decade long fight with the whole peninsula wide effort to say, you know, we need to incorporate this city to protect a quality of life, open space. I had the good fortune to go out and talk to some of the original founders and, um, and take a look and reflect back on the story about how cityhood happened here and also just how the dream continues to be preserved. So we're going to take a quick break and we're going to share a brief um, video that I put together that really talks about the incorporation of RPV. So we'll take a look. Rancho Palos Verdes, founded 40 years ago, is the peninsula's youngest city. It is paradise, as I keep saying. You know, we live in paradise. What's not to love in RPV? You know, you have uh, uh, the coastline, the beaches, the trails, the preserve the school system, the neighborhoods, the people. RPV's story is exciting. Long ago, Tongva Indians, Spanish explorers, cattle ranchers, and farmers lived off the land. A promised land sought out by New York investor Frank Vanderlip. Vanderlip bought the entire peninsula, sight unseen, a hundred years ago. And he came out here in a private railroad car with his family to, to see it. And they basically took a, a car and they came over the top of the hill and there was nothing out here, and it was just absolutely beautiful. By 1957, there were three peninsula cities, when a peninsula-wide movement began to form a fourth. Residents feared massive development in the unincorporated area controlled by LA County, and they wanted local control. We had to raise the consciousness of a lot of people. My role was to um, get the news into the newspapers uh, as frequently as we possibly could so that we could uh, let everybody know what was happening at the county level. The League of Women Voters, the PV Peninsula Advisory Council, and the group Save Our Coastline joined forces, 
Rolling Hills Mayor Fred Hess, activists Dorothy LeConte and Gordon Curtis led the 10-year battle with the county. People were very determined. Everybody, Barbara and Betty talk about the excitement. I really think about the determination of everybody. A state Supreme Court ruling finally paved the way for a cityhood election. And on September 7th, 1973, RPV officially incorporated and the first city council was sworn in. They elected five of us on a city council. Myself, Marilyn Ryan, Bob Ryan, no relation, uh, Gunther Burke, and Dave Cisco Ruth. I think the biggest challenge for the first city council was keeping faith with the electorate. It, over 80% of the community voted in favor of incorporation. This is unheard of for a uh, new city. In our general plan, we have a low density city, and I think that is the key to keeping the founders' dream alive. And we have abundance of open space. We have beautiful views. We have open space. I very, very much rely on the relationships that I've got with some of the original founders to help me steer uh, uh, what we do today on the council. Preserving the founders' dream continues, a landscape protected for generations to come. The celebration of, of preserving a quality of life. Uh, and I think that's something that many people, many communities are fighting to struggle to hold on to. Uh, we have such a strong sense of community in my neighborhood and I think throughout the city. I'm really honored and we are really blessed to be here in Rancho Palos Verdes. You know, Mayor, in putting that segment together, of course, I talked to all the council members, like yourself, about preserving the dream, but to be able to sit down with some of those city founders that, you know, brought me back in time about that hard fight, and then just have some of them were at the gala. Yeah. It was really, really special. You know, Dina Friedson was there, and also Betty Field Strauss. Unfortunately, Barbara Gleghorn could not make it, but um, she did give me a call this morning to say how thankful she is at the city and that we are reminding and continuing to tell people about the story, about that we don't forget how hard it was to have what we have here today. And that's a good point, uh, Liz, because people have to remember that Googling, Googling names from the 19, early 70s or anything prior to the internet, particularly municipal government names, as I pointed out the other night at the council meeting, if you're, um, you know, unless you're Huey Long or somebody with a... Right, you may a, not find out. ...with a uh, record, so to speak, uh, you might not find out too much about what they've done. But yes, I think the fact that it was 43 battles and 43 times, but it was clearly a wonderful evening and uh, clearly worth fighting to keep, um, maintain the semi-rural atmosphere. But when you think about that evening, we got, I got a phone call a couple of days prior. We were desperate to find a 40s car, vintage vehicle, but there was a Concorde that was um, conflicting with it that day. So it was very difficult. So I did get a phone call from um, Craig Eckberg, whom I just got to know. And uh, he said, you know what? I may not be able to deliver you a car, but how would you like to <laughs> fly the, fighting, the Flying Tiger Squadron to come over and do formation flying just as you're um, settling into your dinner prior to going inside. And I said, oh my gosh, that would be amazing. And they were able to do that. And we had four planes, World War II, vintage planes, and they were the they were so wonderful. And then the pilots came in to the dinner later on. It was really, it was special because it was, everybody was gathering for the beginning of this gala. And then, you know, the sun was coming out because the weather started off iffy. And then here you are, beautiful Terranea and the coastline and the sun's coming out and everyone's getting out dressed 1940 style. Many people were into their you fat. Were, for yes, sure. I got my you 40s lovely. hairdo. I didn't do victory rolls, but people were really, really getting into the whole spirit of the right, 1940s. I love that. And then you had this, like nobody really knew what was going on. And then, Boom, you just look up into the sky and it became, I told you, the party went from 40 fabulous and flying high to That's see that, right. right? It did go to flying high. Was, and then and it, was it was flying great. on the dance floor after that because you got a band there that people were kicking and clicking on that dance floor. That was great. I couldn't <laughs> wait to um, to finish the presentation so we could just start the music. We are actually we could be, we could talk about that gala all all day today, and we're going to spend we are going to go back to it because um, there was some important nonprofits that are going to benefit. We want to talk about Clearly. that, and we also have another piece to show about landmarks um, in the city that Maria Sorrego produced that also was shown that night. 
But we're going to from now just uh, take... That was an excellent video that you did, oh, by the well, way. Well, thank you. I very, really appreciate that. Um, we're now going to move on just to talk more about uh, big issues happening in the city. You've had so many things going on in the recent council meetings. We I have. don't know where to begin other than we'll start with the most Intense recent... Intense meetings, long, um, with a lot of activity. <laughs> a lot of activity, a lot going on, and... Um, Hopefully, they're um, all for the best, clearly all for the best interests of the people of Rancho Palos Verdes. Right. And what residents always, you know, what you really they want, to, want to know about is quality of life, safety, um, those issues. And crime has really come up recently at your last meeting, um, sort of setting the record straight so what people understand. There has been some discussion about um, where, where the crime statistics are right now in our community. Why don't you share what you do know about crime in RPV? Sure. I can tell you that um, Councilman Mizzetich and I are on the uh, Regional Law Enforcement Committee. And we share on that committee together because we share the Sheriff's Department with the cities of Rolling Hills Estates and Rolling Hills. So, um, and Palos Verdes Estates has its own police department, for those of you who may not know that. But we have a very high quality Sheriff's Department and uh, we have a very safe community. There are always occasions where you have occasional spikes in crime. And we have been ever vigilant to be watching for, with our quarterly reports, monthly reports have come out, and um, it, information came out of them. in the month of March, there was one of those spikes in crime. And um, we're talking about, like, when we look at um, numbers of people, you know, when we talk about robberies, for example, we're talking about four. So in the total first quarter. And we're not talking about huge numbers for 42,000 people. Actually, and it's, it's really quite low. And when we look at the quarterly report, um, we will see that we were actually 8% down in our um, part one crimes, which are consist of anything having to do with um, robbery, aggravated assault, homicide. There was a homicide, but that was later pulled from Rancho Palos Verdes. And, because it went, took place in Long Beach. Right. And so there has been, so the goal is to make sure that people are aware to that neighborhood watch is important, but also it's very important that we be careful not to um, sensationalize things to the point where eventually you are complaining about something and no one's listening because they think you're crying right. wolf. I think we talked before, it's, it's how do we inform our residents without alarming them? That's what you need to do. Very and clear. statistics, you know, can tell you anything you want. So, you know, when people might have heard that in the month of March, we saw crime highly spike in, in our PV, but the big picture is the whole quarter. It actually decreased 8%, and that's the number that really, yes. really means something. I mean, it all means something. One crime and, is too and many. And if you but say that the, there was a 61% peak and you're talking about a handful of numbers, that's another issue. In addition to that, when you look at the actual crimes, they get culled at the end of the month. So something might be like a gardeners stealing from other gardeners, which does happen often. Or um, uh, an incident where there was a shoplifting case in Marshalls and Western Avenue and the woman ended up pushing into someone else, so that was considered robbery. Um, you have to, these get culled, they get changed. In fact, the March statistics, they sift through them, and um, that's why looking at the averages is always better. But clearly, we always want to make sure people see crimes of opportunity are really, we just came from the sheriff's meeting this morning, so this is really an opportune time to discuss this. Um, uh, crimes of opportunity, like um, people driving past or walking past cars that are unlocked. This is this is it's it's such such a no brainer you would right. think. But now we have people like well they have had always um, skateboarding down the street and they click on the different cars to see who's unlocked and come back in the evening and if you see a pair of designer sunglasses there it's an easy steal. Mm -hmm. So these are things that we can avoid, but overall, when you look at where we are, we had an 8% decrease in crime for part one crimes in the first quarter. And we haven't really, we have actually increased our patrols. Um, last year, Councilman Mizetich was largely instrumental in seeing to the bicycle patrol on Western Avenue, and we have the Polaris, Polaris's, you know, those little automated bicycles. Mm -hmm. 
and they have been doing a very good job of keeping crime down right. over there in that area. We also have the volunteers on patrol. Um, the volunteers on patrol are individuals that drive in what looks like a sheriff's car. They're white with the gold um, band, and they keep your they they help with your eyes and ears, Liz. And mm -hmm. so we have um, over 1,500 hours have been logged now, and. 79 volunteers, which is, That's they're just incredible. increasing, which is a really great thing. And, and our neighborhood watch programs are getting stronger. But volunteers on patrol are also there um, in neighborhoods where there may have been something suspicious. Um, there is suspicious activity. There are still, uh, still some unsolved, there's still an unsolved crime out there. So we learned about these cells, um, that these criminals, Right now, I asked if they were, this was a result of the early release program, um, the realignment program by the governor. And it's still, um, Captain Boland says it's still too early to identify whether this is the case, but we need to stay focused and we need to just see that it could go either way. Right. Um, and you know, facts are stubborn things, as Ronald Reagan said. So I think it's important to keep the facts in perspective. Because if we start to, as I pointed out earlier, you know, we just have to make sure that um, we don't say that the sky is falling, henny penny, chicken <laughs> little, because the fact is we live in a very safe community and we're really f blessed to be here, but we are also it is important for us to be ever vigilant. Well, that's, that's sort of the catch-22, I think. When you live in a community like RPV and you know you're the second safest city in all of L.A. County for sure, then your guard can be kind of down, right? I remember when I first moved here, I honestly would say, you know, I, barely, I never hardly, I didn't lock my house. But now, of recent, I thought, you know, you could, that's just like you saying, making a crime of opportunity for someone. You need to lock your, you know, doors and your car and all that, so. Right, and, so, and we won't, so we won't know about whether or not those early release programs are, but we also increased a traffic safety patrol officer. And uh, that really has proven, actually it, <coughs> it proved just last week to be very helpful with um in helping some senior citizens right that was so, with officer knox and i don't yes. know if you wanted to talk about that situation because it's what happened with him is there were two seniors that were yes. locked were in their home for several days and, and needed assistance At least two days these these two seniors and um actually one of our employees here her mom uh was one delivering meals on wheels and uh she she saw that there were left meals left at the front door and knocked on the door and this she heard sounds and they said, well, we're okay, but they were both on the floor and two elderly people and um, <clears throat> Deputy Knox came and he was able to um, gain entrance, I think, and together the with the fire, fire department. department came, yeah. And so um, they were taken to area hospital and yeah, it's very important and, and we are looking into now creating a program, um, probably a volunteer program. I'm working together with uh, going to be working together with Susie Siemens. To, we're looking into what Palos Verdes Estates has. They have a program called PVE Cares, and that is run actually through their police department where they check on homes and they check on individuals. We're looking at perhaps we may be able to do something um, even with volunteers on patrol, right. this type of a thing, through the sheriff's department or through the community and volunteers. But clearly, I can tell you in my neighborhood, we have established, we establish programs or we establish relationships with our neighbors so we know to check on them. Right. Because we are the aging of the peninsula. We are graying and aging. And people don't want to leave their homes. And if they don't want to leave their homes, it's really important that we have a sense of community. Because this is going to be right. the community of the future. No, absolutely. We're yeah. all going to be... And this, our seniors are unfortunately you know, you know, most vulnerable to uh, being victims of crime in all, in all different ways. I know I have a 90-year-old next-door neighbor, and we collect her mail every day, and we, you have to check very in. Very important. Things like that. So. And they're more vulnerable, so yes. very important. All right. Anything in the area, obviously safety, one of, the, your, you know, one of your biggest concerns as a mayor and, and that you want to talk about, we can move on to some other stuff that has been coming up. I think we kind of covered it. I, I think we yeah. kind of covered it. I think it's really important just for people to know that um, um, it's this is paradise. Yeah, it's you, not heaven. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and you always say, so there's always still room for improvement, yes. even in paradise. Um, last council meeting, one of the big issues that came up was uh, what Marymount, um, they were looking for an extension with a permit. It was granted. Talk about what Marymount, what's going on with Marymount in the city right now. 
Well, it's been going on for over 10 years now. It's, it's been up and down and all around the bend. And it's been very confusing for many, many people. Um, and I have to say that uh, the council on uh, Tuesday night decided to grant the extension request that they had for, they had three phases of this project, seven years. And really, they're, they're the only ones that have been granted this kind of a phasing in project. Um, but the problem is that the projects change and change and change, and there have been so many requests and so many changes that right now we're not sure whether or not they're going to be able to meet their request, the demands, um, by September 30th, which was their one-year date. But they're requesting a modified field, uh, athletic field, and that is that has to come through under a separate request. Um, and that is very significant because safety is a huge issue and uh, all of the, basically, basically I think all of the council members expressed that, that safety, um, of course, was a key concern. Mm -hmm. um, so there were tennis courts in the original field. The modified field that they are seeking does not have the tennis courts in it and those tennis courts were put there to be a buffer for soccer ball, balls to keep them from flying into the curve. So. Um, it's one of those stay tuned. It keeps but also, you know, the grading, they have to do the grading, demolition of buildings, grading, utilities, facilities. There were so many items in phase one that have not even begun that um, I, I don't know. I think it'll be, it'll be hard pressed to see that this will take place actually by, by the fall, uh, by September 30th. But if they feel that they can do it. Um, that is, that is, that is the, um, what they've been granted to do. When I was watching the discussion about Marymount College, I mean, they have, have a long history in this city, and it's, at times it's been very you know, tenuous and divisive at times, but then we also celebrate that college is a jewel of the community. It's a wonderful place. My kids went to preschool there, and you said you actually taught there. Actually, and I did teach and, you know, there, and actually uh, my daughter actually went to preschool there too, and she went to college for one year there. So, but I didn't yes, realize how it started as an elementary school, and then yeah, it, when I didn't it realize. It started as a, right, a Catholic yeah. elementary, a girls elementary school, and then progressed to a girls high school, and where it was 300 students. So it's a very impacted community, a very rural community. It's probably one of the more rural in all of Rancho Palos Verdes, um, and a very um, perilous road. Um, Palos Verdes Drive East is, is no uh, easy road to get around on. So we do have, um, there, is a there are restrictions just on the basis of the environment. But I am thrilled to see that they have actually moved a lot of their, um, some of their new classes and residences into San Pedro, mm -hmm. particularly down by the waterfront. I think it's going to be really excited with so many opportunities. I mean, things are flat and you've got high rises and it's a whole different environment. Right. So, and I'm calling it Marymount College, but they changed their yeah, name. Yeah, they did. They, again. Yes. Yeah, so. so now it's Marymount University. Marymount California University. Right, so I have to get that, remember that one. But um, so we'll see them on many more city council agendas, I'm sure, so you can keep us posted. Well, I think the next time they will be coming on would be in, uh, in unless in the, well, the EIR, of course, on the athletic field as well. Okay. The revised um, proposal. Also at that council meeting, you, I mean, your council meeting, I know you're doing a great job. You're saying we got to get out of here before 11, so, but that one ran a little bit over. Well, and you it, had a lot going on. <laughs> we had a lot going on. There Thanks. were some ceremonial matters. We had, um, we actually, uh, the council um, voted to um, rename the, um, inside Hess Park, we have the community center where the city council meetings are taking place. And so the council, um, uh, council mayor pro tem de Hovick brought forth an item uh, for the renaming of that particular council location um, to be called uh, in honor of former Mayor John McTaggart, who served 20 years. Yeah. Um, he's a wonderful man. Um, mm -hmm. He was completely dedicated to this city and this community, and he did a lot on the outside. And I served with him. I had the honor to serve with him uh, 20 years ago. Anyway, to rename it in his honor, the John McTaggart um, Hall, Memorial Hall and Council Chambers. Nice. So, and, and when and if a new council city, city hall should be built, that 
that name would follow it okay. to that location. Okay. So, so that was that was nice. That was I'm sure his family else. was there and And they were. It was great to see them. We did not even know they were there when the whole thing came right. up. So And he used to twenty years, I think he was the actually probably the longest serving council member of all the city councils that we've had in the forty years of the city's history, right? Oh uh, I know that Bob Ryan served right from he's he was twenty years also. Also, okay. Yes. So see and you're following kind of in that path coming back again, right? <laughs> You served 20 no, years no. ago. No, 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 we're not going to get you for 20 you know, years, Susan. When you look at this, oh, we have term limits. Of all, we have term yeah, limits. Yes, so that's not going to happen. Not only that, but people <laughs> serve the community. And this is important because um, I also moved that we moved that policy number 37. We need to move more toward a wall of honor because um, renaming facilities in the, with names of people, when you have somebody who doesn't remember, for example, Fred Hess, who he was, and like you said, we have to struggle to know who these people are. Right. Um, then at some point you have to stay away from naming facilities after people and perhaps start looking at keeping the geographic and the geological beautiful surroundings that we have in the form of those titles and acknowledging key people in the community who do not have to be, by the way, elected officials. Mm -hmm. So there are many community members and community people who are aging right now that um, I can see on a future wall of honor. Right. And I think it's time to do it. All right. Um, moving on, we have the matrix report that um, you might want to explain more to our viewers and residents that might not know what's going on. That's something that the council um, had put together, and now you're take, taking action on the yes. findings of that mm. report. Talk about that. Uh, well, when I was running for council, one of the issues that came up was um, there was a lot of there were a lot of questions about whether or not um, there was. We heard remnants, and we heard sounds and echoes of no accountability, no transparency, no oversight. And this was being resonated um, by a small minority, but a very vocal minority on, in the city. And it was very easy to fall into that. And I have to say that um, former city manager, Len Wood, who helped on my campaign, pointed out to us how it would be important if there was a concern about something like that to do a performance evaluation, otherwise known as an or organizational assessment where you can actually go into the workings of the staff and of it, it was designed in, to be an internal document. And with a lot of the pressure, it became an internal quasi-external document with a lot of input from also commissioners and committee members. Um, one of the council members, Campbell, brought in um, members to, uh, into some of these interviews that were meant to, uh, you know, specifically for council members, um, people such as Ken Dida was involved um, in meeting about some of the city's history on this. Mm -hmm. So this kind of um, it, but it was I a guess comprehensive report. Overall, it was a very comprehensive report. It came. They, it took nine months to come to fruition. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem DeHovic and I were the team that worked together with Matrix, the company, to. Um, develop the report to get gather further information and um, we have received and filed it and we'll be looking at it again but for the most part um, people should know that the city is in good shape the city is is financially secure we are more financially stable in fact than um, the, probably than the land we sit on. <laughs> there you go. But, especially if we were in Portuguese Bend. But that's a key issue yeah, yeah. because we because better of be that, more stable than well, that. Be, <laughs> no. but because of that, because we do have uh, geological issues, uh, we always have to save for a rainy day. So we have a very healthy reserve. But we also there's always room for improvement, and a lot of these have to do with suggestions that we actually came up with throughout the course of the year. And these changes have actually been taking place throughout this year. So um, one of them, one of the suggestions that we have was that we have a, um, we go to bid on our sizable projects, which we had already looked at, like IT, perhaps the city attorney. Um, these are considerations that the council will have because the city has never gone to bid on these. And to never have gone to bid on something, um, personally, I believe, does a disservice to the people. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you never know what you're going to get, even with a service that you may have and that you want to keep right. uh, in the form of um, doing an RFP. 
So, so you've got that. Some of the other findings had to do in terms of staffing needs. And our staffing needs were all found to be adequate. And actually, the council did put on hold and they did freeze some key positions. So we had some council, we had some staff members like um, Carolyn Petru, our deputy city city um, city manager, who has basically worn every hat at City Hall. Um, she was also Parks and Recreation. She was, she wore about three hats. And this was going on throughout the course of this year. And so now we'll be able to look at other options and we'll be able to hire these um, people because just this Tuesday night we did vote to hire um, these eight frozen staff or, or um, one eight frozen or held out staff personnel. So I think that That'll will be, really be um, a substantial help. That's important. Anything else you want to add that the community might be helpful to them to know about the matrix report and just its findings and you'll just continue? Well, it's available online if you'd like okay. to see it. You there can you just go. go to the RPV website and you can download it. It's pretty comprehensive. It shows the interviews with commissioners and committee members mm -hmm. as well. And they were very helpful and they did surveys. So I just think it was a overall, a, it was a net plus to do, but the results do also show, um, you know, the areas of what they classify as high priority items, medium priority items, low priority items. So we'll be looking at those probably in the order that we would prioritize them to. Okay. When you, we were talking about the metrics report, you mentioned about saving for a rainy day, and that brings me on to our next subject. The San Ramon groundbreaking, you know, because I think of the rain and what happens at San Ramon. This project has been discussed for quite a many years here, and you finally got it going. You did the well, groundbreaking was, as mayor. You must have been pretty excited to have that. That was that a mo that was pro that's the largest infrastructure project in the history of the city. It's a twenty million dollar project, Liz, and um, fortunately we were able to obtain nine and a half million dollars in a matching grant from the state. But this, per, this, this will help to not only address the drainage issue, uh, the floodplain issue um, between San Ramon and down to the water in this, uh, this, this 4,000 foot long pipe. Right. But it will also, it will also address the, um, the stability of the switchbacks which have been perilously close to, uh, they are very, very close right now to the edge of that San Ramon landslide. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is taking place now? That's the project. If you get into the switchbacks right, and you when go you drive PB drive east, really exciting. You see, you see that flashing sign, you're entering the zone like of San Ramon project. Yeah. And but it's great. It's a massive but, undertaking. You know, it's also, we were looking at the whole year and we're looking at the rainy season and we were fortunate we did not have too much rain this year, although right. it just rained this week. I know, <laughs> I know. So it is, it's now on its way and, and in terms of the funding for it, you've got a nine point something million dollar state grant. It is a 20 million and, project. Yes. So what happens next in terms well, we of- have, we, have, uh, we have a reserve and we have a CIP fund that can cover that in itself, but then that would leave us with very little in case of another emergency. So. We have also asked Don Kanabi, our county supervisor, to help, and we have also asked Joe Boscaino because that this From the runs city of through LA. three properties, you know, three count, three jurisdictions, four actually, but it runs through um, the county uh, as far as Friendship Park goes, and then. Down at the bottom is the city of L.A., where the neighbors the are compromised down Palos there. Palos mobile home park is and. Those homes would be very much compromised because in a flood, mm -hmm. they would most likely go. Right. So we have not yet been able to secure funding from either the state, the county, or the city of Los Angeles. But we ha we are looking at um, creative financing options as well. So right. Well, I know we it's, continue to pursue when there's that. a will, there's a way, especially with you. <laughs> when there's a way, there's a when will. When you get a bee in the bonnet, <laughs> you go for it. Um, anything else you want to reference about that play-by-play uh, -play of sort of that day we, when we got out? It was so windy when we got out there oh, to that, that canyon. That was and, um, bizarre. And, uh, but it was, uh, it <laughs> we was were a, blown away by it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was. But it was an exciting a moment. And it was. And for the Public Works team to be there, and they've all worked really hard, too, for this behalf of the city to get that going. And it was the, the Public Works team. The, well, this staff is, <laughs> I just want to say that the more I'm here, and I'm spending a lot of time at City Hall as mayor, but um, the more I'm here, the more I see not just the dedication, but the level of professionalism, it really excels. 
And we are so fortunate to have these people working um, with us, many of them, for many, many years. And that kind of dedication, you know, it's like it is a family. It helps in the extended family that we become. And I think you must also be able to bring such an amazing perspective because here you are mayor in 2013, but you were also mayor 20 years ago. So you've seen Many this, the same people seen the city here. as it's grown up, and you have sort of this point of reference to say, how have we gotten better or what's, I mean, you really, that's, that's pretty. Oh, the level of service has increased tremendously. Right. Um, and the demands on the city as and well, And the demands, right? and not only that, the level of service has increased. The demands on the city are huge. And also the bureaucracy from the state and the federal government and uh, the regulations, um, the paperwork, right. the red tape, it is a mess. And it's not a mess, but I mean what it is, it's, it's, it just adds to the challenge right. that the staff has to be more accountable, just like you do. You have a cell phone, you have a smartphone, everybody out there with a smartphone, you're on call 24-7. So, so yeah. life has changed. And I know you are on call 24-7. You are always, you know, whether you're at the council meetings or at meetings all over the, you know, you go down to the city, um, you just went to the MTA meeting you had, and you hold oh, yes. your own monthly meetings at Starbucks. Bring us up to speed on some of the things you, uh, you've been visiting, um, different groups and doing things. I know you have. Well, yes, actually, um, yesterday I was at the Metro. Metro decided to have a meeting, and I was um, very concerned. I did get a beam <laughs> I heard it, about this. Uh -huh. About this, um, the Metro Express lanes. I, I don't know how many of you are really upset about them, but I am. And so I thought, this is really unfair. You know, there are many people who had qualified carpools. Uh, suddenly, you know, you'd have to have this transponder, and you found yourself, um, you know, in the carpool lane. Or if you didn't, it, it, it's always you're always sitting there in traffic and so I was concerned that particularly people who weren't traveling four times or more um, a month were going to be charged um, a monthly rate. I contacted Jackie Backrack, who is the head of the South Bay COG, the executive director, and a um, former mayor wrote of a letter, a former <laughs> mayor here of Rancho Palos Verdes yes. and, and wrote a very strong letter about this being a problem and went down there yesterday to complain about it and um, in their first meeting and we found out that well yes we did get your letter and we did get these these objections and as a result we have decided to waive that fee so and now for everybody who travels four or less times a month in the carpool lane so I said great now where do I get my transponder right. <laughs> But the transponder you order online, and if you go through AAA, it's thirty-two dollars. Otherwise, it's forty dollars. Um, but but it's, you're not um, penalized if you go less than four times now, in the sense that. But you have happening. to have the transponder if right. you want to get into that lane. Right. So you're not penalized, but you do pay. Yeah. And I understand it's you know I mean it's it, it can be very expensive depending on the time you go. But um, I, I still have a philosophical problem with why they're doing this um, at this point because you still see them jammed. So, well, you've got a lot happening. And um, how about your Starbucks meetings at Golden Cove? How are they going? It's, is it the third Thursday of the month? Yes, it's third Thursday. Um, there'll be one next Thursday. However, I do have to leave a little earlier. I have to leave by 1130 because there was a Salvation Army event that day. But they're generally the third Thursday, start at 10 o'clock. And um, sometimes they go to noon. They go till whenever we're done. But it's an outreach, voluntary effort. And um, people show up sometimes with personal issues. For the most part, we're an informal group of people who discuss what's going on in the city. Um, a lot of regulars um, and uh, well, grows. So right. we, we had about 12 last time. So well, that's great. You get a lot we, of feedback from the community, and that's important. People do, and, and Keeps I think it's you very connected. helpful. It's very helpful. Very, really good to get um, to 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 have these people regularly in touch with what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Good. And some new people who who were just new to the community and they said, well, we want to get involved, so we thought we'd come down here and see how. All right. Well, I'm sure this next meeting, if people show up, went to the gala, that will be a hot topic of conversation because it seems to be the talk of the town still after it's happened, I think. <sighs> that was so much fun. And, that was um, just great. And I brought it back up again because one thing I wouldn't, at the beginning when we were talking about the excitement of the party, um, two really important organizations in the community were are going to receive some of the proceeds from that event. Um, which are the uh, Los Serenos de Point Vicente, yes. the docents over at PVIC, their organization, which does tremendous work for the city, 
um, by being the docents. And then also uh, Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy, who celebrates 25 years. It's their milestone as well. And so they're really, really important organizations that, that really serve our community well. They are. And it was, um, it was a good, it was a suggestion that a portion of the proceeds go to them. <clears throat> and as a result, we'll find out just how much is going to them. But um, I think that the, the budget on this particular item was, was really well accounted for because I was, we were able to get some of these services um, donated. At the, know, the, at the gala. The band was donated by people, by the way, Ruben A and Tammy Garcia. Hills, right? They are new friends of mine. They live in Rolling Hills. They don't even live in Rancho Palos Verdes. Right, because of but, all the in kind donations. When like, I heard that band, I just said, how do we get that band? And they, I found out they were pretty expensive. You know, so, so you got a lot of They were able to make that contribution. Yeah. So with that kind of assistance, it'll, hopefully there'll be more when you figure out that maybe that you'll be able to donate to the um, the two organizations. Yes, absolutely. That's exciting. To which find which out. will be which would be terrific. And they are part of the city, and so you know clearly when you look at what makes what makes our city who we are, that interpretive center and the conservancy. I mean, you right. Know, and of course, Terranea really helped host the party as well while oh they did. Oh my gosh, Terranea was, Terranea just, you know, it, it's another world. It's like, we could be going to Fiji, we could be going anywhere else, but you don't have to. Just go spend a couple of nights at Terranea if you're getting home, so you're just getting, you just yep. want to get out of the house. Get, or, Go traveling. Or do what I did this morning go with my husband. We did our nice walk along the trail there. We kind of go between there and Trump's. We live closer to Trump's. Our walk, and then we go to Sea Beans for our coffee. They have great coffee and great breakfast sandwiches in that little Sea Beans at Terranea. We have a special video. We want to take a break and show yeah, that really yeah, highlights cool. these wonderful landmarks and attractions that make RPV so special. We show this video also at the gala. It's produced by Maria Soreo. Yes. So we're going to roll that now. right now. Rancho Palos Verdes is a jewel on the coastline, a city that garners breathtaking views, miles of open space, and landmarks that attract the world. One of the most recognizable landmarks is the Point Vicente Lighthouse, which stands tall along the bluffs and is a true symbol of the peninsula. The lighthouse was built in 1926 and is operated by the Coast Guard and is on the National Registry of Historic Places. Next to the lighthouse is the Point Vicente Interpretive Center. People come from near and far to watch the migration of the gray whale. I have been a docent for 20 years, so I've seen lots of changes, and it is definitely the most wonderful place on the peninsula. Just across the shore from the Palos Verdes Interpretive Center sits the Terranea Resort, which reflects the beauty and history of the land in Rancho Palos Verdes. There were many, many architectural drawings and we really looked at how the land kind of cascaded down. We feel privileged to be on this site in this land and we're part of a broader community. Everyone's welcome and they can walk the pathways and feel like this is really their property. And before the spectacular property was Terranea, it was another treasure in the community called Marine Land. We were actually startled at how many people were involved with Marine Land over the years. I'm so grateful that I get to come here every day and serve um, this beautiful community and our guests. Not far from Terranea and nestled in nature is the world famous Wayfarers Chapel built in 1951 by architect Lloyd Wright. The Wayfarers Chapel is a Swedenborgan chapel and people come from all over the world to get married here and marvel at the unique architecture. Across the road from the Wayfarers Chapel is Abalone Cove Shoreline Park. It's one of nearly 20 parks run by the city. Abalone Cove, or Ab Cove, has two beaches, tide pools, hiking trails, and picnic areas along the bluffs. No matter what park you visit in RPV, you will find beautiful nature surrounding you. And just down the road at Trump National Golf Course is Founders Park and Marilyn Ryan Sunset Park, which have spectacular views. And speaking of spectacular views, 
you won't find a golf course anywhere that's as stunning as the views from Trump National Golf Club. Every single hole is either on the ocean or a view of the ocean, and there's no course like that in California. The city has been really spectacular. I mean, they want this to be the best. They're very proud of it, and we appreciate that, and we've really had a great relationship with them. The Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy has enjoyed a long-time collaboration with the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, working together to preserve this wonderful open space, which is the 1,400-acre Palos Verdes Nature Preserve. This is such a community treasure and landmark. It has amazing trails running through it with great habitat, wonderful scenic vistas, and lovely wildlife. No matter where you are in Rancho Palos Verdes, the landscape shines brightly. There are cultural and architectural wonders to see, businesses, schools and institutions to enjoy, and a treasure-filled community to celebrate. We congratulate um, the city on their 40-year anniversary. We're very happy to be part of their celebration. Again, I want to thank Maria Soraya. She did a great job showcasing just the amazing landmarks and attractions. We are so lucky to live here. I mean, it's just one after the other, whether you're at the lighthouse or, you know, you travel down the coastline and you take in that open space. And I'm wondering, what do you have a favorite spot that sort of speaks to you? You know, I do. I really love the Wayfarers Chapel. I think that it is a place where, particularly when you need to get away, and you just want to get some serenity and peacefulness, to be able to get out of the car and walk over to the edge and look at an inspiration point um, and look back at that magnificent building. My father-in-law, who was a major general in the Air Force, we had his, um, he lived up in Washington State, but we had his funeral, um, his memorial service down there at the Wafer's Chapel, and he was, they gave him a 21-gun salute, and I think about that. And I think about all of the wonderful activities I had bringing my children up on the peninsula here. Um, it was it, the way that chapel is with the Tree of Life in the center that Frank mm -hmm. Lloyd Wright Jr. designed. It's magnificent, and uh, it can't be beat. I know. I had, was fortunate enough. I worked at that chapel for about a year, helping them with um, programs in, within the chapel. And every day, I just would just, it takes your breath away to be up there. And um, it is so special. And what I love so much about it, it being called the Wayfarers Chapel, it's really there for the entire world and for the community. There's no membership. Right. And mm -hmm. even though it's a Christian denomination, they're, they're really their mission, they say, is two words, do good. Right. And it Sweden does, Borgen. I love yes. that, you know, yeah. and there's so much that it does good, more better than good. And so, we're, you know, and it's just a great place to pause, you know, and take take and appreciate what you have mm -hmm. in that setting. So yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah, that, I would say we that. are. You know, we still everywhere we go. Like my backyard was featured in one of those videos. And yeah, and you have you a, didn't know that, but I love the the flowers, the flora, the fauna, and nature. So if I can attract butterflies, um, hummingbirds, um, you know, all the better. Right. I just don't want the raccoons. Well, as we, we, we wrap it up on that note, we, um, we end with, you know, the city's 40th gala we started with, but this is a year celebration, right? We're 40 all year long, and there'll be more things to come, you know, the 4th of July party that will kind of still pay tribute Absolutely. to the founding of the city. And, of course, the official founding is September 7th. And um, this will be the first time in the history of the city, by the way, other than the day, the original day, to my understanding, that we've actually had an event on September so, 7th. So, that, so, so yes, that is that will be some type of event still in the works okay. at Trump. It's always great to have the mayor in here with me and uh, bringing the community up to speed. We'll see you again next month. It's great but to see you, But until then, Liz. thanks for joining As us. As always. That's going to do it for this edition of RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. See you next time.